When the Civil War began in 1440 in the realm of St. Stephen, the faction led by Queen Mother Elizabeth von Luxemburg was largely supported by the court nobility, the magnates, most of the free royal cities, and had support from external backers, though that support structure had problems. Elizabeth handed the Holy Crown of St. Stephen and her son, King Ladislav V, for safekeeping to her ally and cousin-in-law, Friedrich von Habsburg of Austria, who was also acting as regent in Ladislav's Austrian lands. Among her other external support, the most significant were the services of the Bohemian mercenary Jan Yishkra and his army of mercenary veterans from the Hussite Wars, who proved to be a very effective asset on the battlefield and in raiding Vladislav's back lines. But, by one reading of events, Yushkra was a self-serving bandit, whose mercenaries stole the royal mining revenues, who raided and ran a raiding protection racket in northern Hungary, especially around the urban areas, all of which were on their side of the conflict. They also force converted the local population to Hussitism, and took out loans from local bankers and moneylenders with no intention of repaying them. By another reading of the events, Yushka was an honorable, loyal, and able commander, faithful to King Ladislav V, who had a little trouble controlling his men. Other urban areas in the realm, especially the free royal cities, which supported Elizabeth and Ladislav, also suffered indignities, often being effectively occupied and taken over by the nobility, from their own side of the conflict. One of the main culprits in this being Ulrich of Zele, who forcefully took over several cities in the Kingdom of Slavonia. The church was also not spared, especially in the areas that had open positions when the war started, and the factions started fighting to install their preferred man to them. But no matter which side won, the nobility would take over a portion of the church lands anyway. Now, unlike Elizabeth, who got assistance from outside of the realm, King Vladislav I of Hungary and Third of Poland did not get any. The Polish-Lithuanian estates decided that this was the king's private endeavor, which they disapproved of. So Vladislav could only really count on the broad support he enjoyed from the minor nobility of the realm of St. Stephen. But Vladislav had two very excellent commanders on his side of the war. Nicholas of Ilok, Ban of Machva, member of an old-ish family with a pedigree stretching back to at least the Angevin dynasty. Nicholas of Ilok was also a turncoat. He had been on the side of Queen Mother Elizabeth during the events of early 1440, and even attended the coronation of Ladislav V, but then decided to change sides. The other commander was Janos Hunyadi, Ban of Severin. Janos was a second-generation Zigismundian parvenu. His father was a Transylvanian knight who rose out of the minor nobility while serving Zigismund, and was rewarded with the castle of Hunyad in Transylvania. Janos Hunyadi also served at the court of King Zigismund before being moved into the service of the Ban of Severin, and eventually being appointed to the position himself. After subsequent successes on the battlefield, Vladislav appointed them both as joint voivods of Transylvania, gave them the royal salt monopoly revenues, appointed them to the command of the southern border, and gave them grants of land which belonged to the supporters of King Vladislav V, as further motivation for the two to go capture it themselves. Janos and Nicholas swept the south and secured the surrender of the supporter of the Queen Mother, George de Brankovic, and took the lands that were promised to them. After securing the south for Vladislav, Nicholas of Ilok went to serve the king at court, while Hunyadi built up the defenses against external threats, threats that might and did use the chaos to their own advantage, while also building up his own power base. During this, Hunyadi won several significant enough victories against the Ottomans. Part of this was Hunyadi's sojourn into Vlachia, 
where he overthrew Prince Vlad II and then Salman Mirzad II because they were paying tribute to the Sultan, which they were probably doing since Hungary was not exactly stable or able to protect them, Hunyadi replaced Vlad II with Basarab II, a son of former Prince Dan II, who didn't last long enough on the throne and was overthrown by Vlad II, who now had the support of the Sultan, who held two of Vlad's sons hostage. Nevertheless, Hunyadi's victories resounded throughout the realm and some would say Europe. Hunyadi gained a reputation for invincibility against the Ottomans, even though the Ottomans might not have been significantly damaged by these losses. But this is a moment where other events in Europe start to coincide with everything mentioned. In 1439, at the Council of Florence, representatives of the Catholic and Orthodox churches met and, again, seemingly, arguably, on paper, achieved the union of the church and the resolution of the Great Schism, provided that Christian forces managed to liberate all the Christian, that is to say Byzantine territory, held by the Ottoman Empire. Pope Eugene IV sent out our old friend from the Hussite Wars, Cardinal Giuliano Cesarini, to the realm of St. Stephen, with orders to bring about peace and cooperation in this frontline realm and unite the sides against the common enemy to appeal to the opposing side's sense of honor. Cesarini allegedly, for the first time, used the legendary words bulwark or bastion of Christianity to describe, in this case, the realm of St. Stephen, a descriptor that will stick around for at least one of its countries. With Cesarini's presence, peace talks began in 1442, where Queen Mother Elizabeth and King Vladislav I met for the first time and agreed to a truce, which was quickly over when Elizabeth died on the 16th of December, her supporters believing that she had been poisoned during the gift exchange. After her death, fighting resumed and drew to a bloody stalemate. Elizabeth sighed, fighting in the name of King Vladislav V, who along with the Holy Crown was still in the custody of Friedrich III of Austria. Cesarini again managed to get the parties to agree to another truce, for one year, for one attempt at a united campaign against the Ottomans, before the moment of opportunity passes, because there were reports that the majority of the Ottoman army was in the east, in Anatolia. And so a crusading army assembled under King Vladislav I and his top commander, Hunyadi. The three-year-old king was not there for obvious reasons. The army marched towards Sofia in the autumn of 1443. The most important achievement of this campaign was that the army had returned, without suffering a major defeat, and this was hailed as a magnificent triumph, hoping to gather an even bigger army. Cesarini spread the word across Europe, that the myth of Ottoman invincibility was broken. As far as Europe was to know, the Ottomans could be beaten, and right now were in a weakened state. And in fact, they technically were. Most of the Sultan's army was in Anatolia fighting the Karamanids. And so the wheels were set in motion. On the back of the alleged triumph, Cesarini and the papacy sent out a call for a bigger European crusade. An army from all over Europe assembled in Hungary. Balkan princes stopped paying tribute to the Sultan, and some even rebelled. And there was talk about unified Christian navies blocking the Dardanelles. And Sultan Murad II, now pressed on both sides and at home, was becoming a bit desperate. 